Welcome to Rotary Connections. I'm Barry Thomas. We're highlighting two businesses today, the Barber Shop at Mount Eliza and the Black Spur Inn at Narvathon. Both of these businesses have been impacted by the COVID-19 lockdown. We have a number of Rotarians on the panel today. Our guest is Craig Lapsley, former Victorian Emergency Management Commissioner. But first up, Bill Lang from Small Business Australia. Bill, are business owners motivated to get going again? Yeah, look, they fall into a couple of groups, Barry. Uh, those that uh, have seen what they now call JobKeeper 3.0 and that they are eligible for it um, and, and they can then forecast, you know, what level of cash they might get in to cover their own wage and a couple of other employees. They're feeling uh, more secure for the short term uh, and therefore have, you know, greater ability to sort of look over the parapet and start thinking about, you know, when they can open back up, how they will do it, et cetera. So that group is uh, more positive. Uh, but then there's another group that, uh, you know, again, every time they hear of some announcement, they, they hold out some hope that maybe they'll be eligible. And then as they look into it and their bookkeepers and accountants look into it for them, they see that they're not. And, and that starts to feel like another nail being whacked into the coffin. Uh, and as you can imagine, if you're stuck in that coffin and you're hearing another nail go down, it's getting darker. They're a group that are becoming uh, more anxious, uh, you know, in some cases uh, depressed uh, and not seeing that there's potentially, you know, any light at the end of the tunnel. Is long-term social distancing going to cause a problem? Look, I think it depends on the business that you're in, and I think it's a good point for you to bring up. If I, um, if I had a business that involved people being close together, e.g. a restaurant uh, or a bar type scenario, or perhaps a dance school, um, I, I would be assuming that uh, physical distancing, you know, keeping two arms apart or 1.5 metres is here to stay. So just assume that's a long-term thing. Uh, so depending on the industry, uh, that's going to have different implications. Industries where people do get close together uh, and where there's a high fixed expense like rent, uh, they're the ones that need to fundamentally relook at how it might work. So we're already seeing a lot of uh, good stuff coming out of the US in this area. So an area in cities like New York, uh, you know, most of the restaurants now have been allowed automatically to operate out on the footpath or as the Americans call it, the sidewalk. I see the city of Melbourne is starting to explore that at the moment. And we really need here, like all the local governments should just make it... Uh, you don't need to get a permit. You're allowed to operate out the front on the footpath. Uh, and then owners can start doing some calculations around, will they, have, will they be able to have enough people out on the footpath, uh, even using access to the car park, uh, to be able to, you know, generate enough, uh, you know, sell enough meals, generate enough revenue. Now, sit down with the landlord, work out how the rent's going to need to be changed to keep a viable going concern uh, in place. But in some other businesses, it's going to be, you know, very challenging. So, you know, dance schools might be a good example. Um, and again, it might be there with the fixed expense of the rent, you know, that the landlord's going to need to take a bit of a haircut to potentially keep that tenant in business uh, and with a lower level of rent, but that under that one and a half metre rule, the business can survive. Then there'll be some others that I think, uh, you know, the reality is in terms of the way they deliver their services. If, if it has to be done up close, can't be done any other way, uh, it's going to be uh, very, very difficult to see that, you know, the old way they did it could ever be done again. I'd like to um, say hi to everyone and thank Sam for coming along today. Sam's a um, young Frankston guy. He grew up in Frankston. He went to Woodley School and he's married to his wife, Leah, and has got two little gorgeous kids under three. He owns the barber shop in Mount Eliza that he opened in 2014 that specialises in men's grooming. And one of his clients has been Alan Moore. Alan's popped down there and had a few haircuts and when... This is a side note, when Alan was very sick in hospital and he couldn't get a hair, haircut, um, Alan's one of our Rotarians, a 98-year-old Kokoda veteran. No, he's 99. He's 99. <laughs> 99 now, when he was about 98. Um, Sam sent one of his boys in to specially look after Alan in hospital, which was such a kind gesture of him. So um, uh, Sam, as you realise from that, is very community-minded. He supports Mo the Movember Foundation each year that supports men's mental health and he runs monthly blokes nights gets together blokes can go to the barber shop and just chat and hang out together um, he also volunteers at our brekkie club and sam's a bit of an entrepreneur as well earlier this year he brought the idea of shuffleboard to australia i'd seen it over in canada when i was there in my travels last year so it, i was quite interested and it's this shuffle it's a game that um, he put into bars and he brought that to Australia. And the week before COVID, 
Um, he opened his first shuffleboard bar in Surface Paradise in Queensland and a week later it had to be shut down. So I spoke to him at the beginning of um, COVID and um, the first lockdown, he was sort of juggling how to deal with it. But then when I spoke to him yesterday, he had a, quite a different um, approach to um, COVID. And um, we've got Sam's come along today to talk us through how he's dealing with his journey, um, running a business or two businesses one here in one interstate um, and surviving COVID. Thanks, Sam. First time COVID hit, um, everyone was pretty uncertain with what was going to happen, especially in business with business support um, and just the uncertainty and fear of what was going to happen. So I feel like most businesses and most people in the community weren't really sure kind of what to do and, and, and you're just kind of in damage control basically and making sure your staff are going to be okay and they're going to get money and what are you going to do? And I was basically, all three businesses, I've got a bar in Brisbane, which I opened up in December, that got shut down. <clears throat> then all my shuffleboards uh, were in pubs and that got shut down. And then I came back to the shop and the shop, uh, I had a meeting with all my staff and basically we spent two hours talking about everything we can do safely to trade and then after the third hour I said who actually wants to work and it was pretty unanimous and everyone said we're not comfortable I think it's the right thing for us to do as far as the community and ourselves to close so that was a pretty stressful time um, so that was a bit of a juggling act but but the second time we've we've locked down personally I've taken it as a bit of a break mentally to be able to completely shut off have four weeks of the initial lockdown where I'm just spending time at home with my family, all my staff are looked after with JobKeeper. So it, I think you feel safe and comfortable maybe stepping it back a bit and using the time this lockdown to, to maybe prepare for reopening and get some energy back. Um, we, I did a lot of stuff. Uh, I, can you hear me? Sorry, I've just got an internet... Yep. Um, yeah, so, and then come back and have the energy to, to, to reopen again for, you know, a second time um, and start to kind of be um, effective in the community as well for our clients. Um, anything else? <laughs> um, so, yes. well, I guess a question for you, Sam. You probably don't own your premises. No, I don't. No, no, so, no. So, so what sort of least. support, sort of relief, relief have you had from from landlords in regard to rent reductions or rent rent waiving while you're not trading? Has there any been any support there? Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, at the beginning, I called my landlord a week before we closed the first time, and he went on a rant, a racist rant about. <laughs> Asians and this is ridiculous. We're not Europe and blah blah blah. It's an overreaction. Didn't want to hear about it. Then we closed. I, I contacted him again. He wouldn't. He basically was just putting head, head, his head in the sand. Um, and then he called me a week before we opened and said, "Oh, people are trading. Are you going to be all right?" Like he really flipped and made sure we're okay. And then gave me a fifty percent reduction and so he ought. Mm. for when we closed, which is which is good. But it's obviously still a bill that when you're making no money. So it's still an outgoing. Um, and this time around, he, uh, I haven't actually spoken to him yet. So he, he talked about, we talked about um, another lockdown if it came down that, and it was kind of suggesting would be 50% again, um, which is helpful, very helpful. I've got friends that own bars. I've got a friend that owns the bar in um, Frankston. And they've been closed since March, and his landlord's charging him full, full tick. How's he coping? Uh, he's okay. He, he's okay. He's just like, well, what do you want me to do? I've got no money. And, he's, and these landlords, I, it's understandable. As a land, I'm a landlord myself, but I need to pay my mortgage or, you know, it's my income. <clears throat> but he said, well, I've got no money coming in. Um, so I think the, the – the, I, don't, I don't think there's any um, – actual law involved they've just said mediation between landlords and tenants is the way to go and if you can't work it out from there um 
you know, you have to get lawyers involved, I guess. So you, yeah. had, you had another business going, didn't you, Sam? Yeah, so, so, so in three weeks, I, I was in Brisbane and I had to let 30 staff go in the bar that I owned and shut it down. The following week, the shuffleboard, every pub, so 16 pubs, I've got shuffleboards in, rang me and said, we're not paying any bills. And then the following week, I shut down the barbershop. So that was a heavy, it was a pretty heavy time. Um, that's why I'm like, taking a completely different attitude this lockdown, uh, trying to be a bit more positive uh, and taking time out. Sam, the, the business that you've, um, that you've got, is that, uh, are you going to recover okay from, from this? Uh, yeah, we will. What, what I find is, job, I don't know what you're yeah, so I find that the barbershop, it's a really strong business. It's, it's, uh, we've got a huge clientele base. We're really well established. We've got a great product and brand. Um, and we, as soon as we, when we opened after the first lockdown, I opened our online bookings and we had like 250 bookings in overnight. So we'll come out quite strong. I feel like JobKeeper, <clears throat> JobKeeper is really, when you're locked down, you're not making any money. It's just, it's in one hand, out the other. But it's super effective of getting you out of the hole when you come out and you're trading and you're getting, you know, maybe 50% of your wages covered. I think that's, that's why I feel JobKeeper is extremely helpful, is coming out. Did you feel depressed? Did you go through any sort of depression or anything? Yeah, I did. I, I actually spoke to about it on my social media. I've never suffered from really any anxiety or depression. Um, and we do a lot in the shop about men's health and with Movember, so it's spoken about a lot. Um, but I found that I had a lot of stress and anxiety over my businesses, but because I, I was focusing on them, I felt like I had that covered. But then like subtly another part of my life, that's when some anxiety was coming up and it's quite subtle to where it, would, it actually didn't even notice it. And then, I've, and then I, it started growing quite intensely. And then I was lucky that I, you know, I could speak to my wife about it, and have some perspective. And, and that's all I basically needed was just to kind of open up to her. And that was enough for me to kind of deal with that. But um, I know a lot of people, young people in business or not that I'm young anymore, but um, at my age, men who, um, friends of mine who I'm speaking to have been getting really anxious and, and so probably so they should, there's valid reason to be when, you know, your livelihood's taken away from you. But I'm finding it's good because people are actually talking to each other. So a friend of mine spoke to me about he, him, his issues he was having and that gave me a bit more strength to be able to speak to my wife. <clears throat> Hey Sam, it's uh, Wayne Gillen. I was interested in your uh, obviously the entrepreneur itch that you're uh, you're sort of trying to scratch there. But you've got a few businesses going in a few different directions. What's what's the plan? How's it, how they all tie in? Uh, well, the the main plan was well at the beginning. I was a tradie for twelve years, yeah. and I was over it, and I knew it wasn't what I should be doing. It really wasn't yeah. an industry that was showing off my talents, I suppose. So kind of jumped, jumped into the barbershop thing, thought it was a good idea with a friend who was kind of in the hair industry. Yep. And then that kind of left me open to, after a few years of running that, to open. I've always worked in pubs before as well, before I was a tradie, so I like to get back into that space. And the idea of anything that's social and connection between people, I was really interested in. Um, so, yeah, so the the bars and the, the hospitality sector is just kind of, I can manage both now because the barbershop kind of runs itself. So it's set up now with a manager and I can spend my time um, working on those other businesses now, which, um, yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it's a so lot. is the, uh, the barbershop's a cash flow generator, is it, to, to fund the investment? Yeah. Yes. yeah, so the barbershop is where I get my main wage. Um, and but it, but it was also for about flexibility and freedom, like, I've got two young children, a two-year-old and a three-year-old. And when we're looking at having children, well, 
my old job, I would never would have seen him. I would have been up at 5.30. Yep. I would have been home at 6.30, maybe in time to put him to bed yep. and maybe see him on the weekends. And I'd be away a lot. And that's just not <clears throat> what I wanted to have as a lifestyle, being a father. So that was a big part of it. And I wanted freedom to be able to do what I want with my own time. So um, the shop's been able to do that and it's been able to give me money and freedom to move into other kind of industries. Yeah, I was interested that you uh, did your expansion. Uh, you made it really simple for yourself you know, by going interstate and in a completely different industry. So you didn't, yeah, yeah. Uh, didn't consider it, growing the, the business you've got? Yeah, I did. I, 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 yeah, I looked at expanding barbershops, but it's so highly... It's such a skilled labor, especially our product that we do. It's quite a high-end product. And yeah. to get quality staff down the peninsula is really tough. Um, I've got seven full-timers at the moment, which is great. But to get another shop, double the risk, double the output, you know, it's just, just wasn't worth it. The business now is doing what it should do. Um, and I just don't want to dilute it, really. Yeah, so you see the bar is simpler? In, in Brisbane? It's simple. No, I've got a business partner, so <laughs> a business partner in Brisbane, so he can deal with a lot of that stuff. So, oh, that makes I, sense. I, I, yeah, I actually, it was a good learning experience because I actually ran, basically ran the books and the finance for the build and the setup for the first three months of the yep. hospitality industry, which was huge for me. Like, it was a good learning experience. I'm glad I'm not doing it anymore. Um, and it, it's good to, I think, just being outside of Victoria was good. And the shuffleboard's the same, like they're in Perth and, and exactly like what took Victoria's locked down and yep. I've still got businesses which are, uh, which are tracking a little bit now. Like Perth, Perth is pumping. Perth is, mm-hmm. I'll speak to the bar there and they're making more money now than they did last year. Really? So yeah. where do you reckon you'll be in five years' time? Where, which, which way are you heading? You've got things going all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, ideally, ideally the shop will still be you know, running and, and ticking along. Um, I've kind of got a bit of a plan maybe to let my manager have some sort of percentage or reward him so because he's been with me from the start and the pubs are a, a franchise model we have the national we have the Australian master franchise for the venues um, so we're looking at opening somewhere between uh, 10 to 16 over the next five years across Australia um, and then hopefully there's Thousands of shuffleboards as well. Yeah. <laughs> so it really, I'm, I'm just running the shuffle company at the moment, but ideally I'd like to be running that and having, you know, um, state and territory managers, salespeople, basically. Yeah. So the barber uh, shop isn't uh, franchisable? Uh, it's not really, because it's quite boutique, I think. And I spent a lot of time in there. Like I, I was there every day for three or four years, building the culture. And I think to... Yeah to build another one. I think it's just such a unique mm. boutique thing where it's a lot of energy and effort put into that. I yeah. think it will lose a lot once it gets franchised. Yeah, it's a bespoke business, yeah. That's correct. Yeah, I was just, yeah. I was just thinking there's a business model, I don't know if he's still going, I think it might have been the US. I think it was called, I might have it wrong, Just Cuts. So the truck driver set it up. Yeah. And he, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. And he had, a, oh, I don't know, 600 outlets or something like that, but he, he, he dumbed it down. He made it quite simple, not, not yeah, as Yeah, but just cuts, as... is not, just cuts is not boutique, Wayne. You just go in yeah. there and get sheared. That's a bad <laughs> that's, right. that's what I mean. That's, that's the sort of model. If you're not going to work in a business, you've got to try and uh, get yes. it. Uh, so the same and, and with two I... bars and, and shuffle thing. You've got to duplicate the, the, it. Yeah, the bars and the shuffleboard stuff, that's perfect because it's a, a franchise. We can sell franchises. We're helping build the global brand as well. Um, so that's something that will be be great to do. The the barbershop, I just like how it's connected to the community, the effort you put in. Um, we can really put back into the community as well. So I actually enjoy that personal connection with it. Then, yeah, it makes me some money, but it's a real funnel for me and the staff to connect and do work through the community. Um, yeah, once, it, once you franchise it, you kind of, you, you lose a bit of control or you've got to sacrifice the things that you hold, I think. Oh, you got to learn how to herd cats as well. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Sam, Sam, Sam are the shuffleboards made in Australia? Uh, no, equipment? They're, no, they're made in Texas. Yeah. Is that so an then, opportunity for Australia? Uh, well, not really, because with that agreement too, we, we have to buy from Texas, the champion shuffleboards, but they are the 
number one tables in the world. So all through, like, through Europe, they're really, really big. Um, there's a certain technology and engineering they have in the tables for a curve so that the pucks move around. Uh -huh. um, and we've got a great deal. Like, um, we, we get a really good price as well. So um, you, to set them, maybe, maybe, but at the moment we're contracted to, to buy from them and use their products and their accessories. Our next business is Diane Kennedy. Diane runs the Black Spur Inn at Narbathon with her husband, Jim. And Di has been really attacked since the Black Sunday bushfires. She's had all sorts of things go wrong from the time of the Black Sunday bushfires. They weren't burnt out. They suffered a lot of damage. Diane, could you start to tell your story, please? It was started as a Cobb & Co changing station to get supplies up to the people that were coming through to mine gold. Overflow from Ballarat and there was quite a lot of gold that was found up um, through our region. After we took over the Black Spur Inn or Narbathong Hotel which is, was known for 30 years of its history um, has been trading non-stop since um, 1861 which is just phenomenal in its own right just recently gone through one disaster after another um, all nature based <laughs> um, but since the um, 09 Black Saturday fires um, we were very fortunate that we weren't burnt down at that time and were able to become a refuge um, for the local community who were totally annihilated around Marysville. Um, our own small little region of, of Narbathong had two timber mills and quite an active timber industry. Um, that's never ever been rebuilt so consequently we at that time not only lost all our community, we lost that underpinning business. So we don't have any infrastructure around us anymore um, and because of that we've had to completely reinvent ourselves and become um, a boutique accommodation and restaurant country inn. We have um, done that, but as you know, Victoria um, and Australia um, have, have suffered quite a few issues with bushfires and we have the beautiful iconic black spur that we're just at the end of and we're at the top of the Yarra Valley. So we're in a unique area for nature-based tourism the location we're only 90 minutes from the center of melbourne so it's very inviting for day trips and and things like that as barry has said we've had to face quite a, a bit a perfect example is the recent um, fires that were down in gippsland and up in new south wales people believed that we had fires all around us and we were inundated with cancellation after cancellation, even functions, Christmas functions were cancelled because people were anxious about coming into a bushfire prone region, even though the fires at that stage were not um, anywhere near us. We're always a, a risk area because we are in the Yarra Ranges. That's part of living in Australia really and, and act responsibly. But the biggest issue is people are now controlled by social media and media and they don't look out the window and think what a beautiful day let's go for a drive um, they get a message on their phone saying high risk day stay at home these are the issues that businesses in our regions now have to face and learn and we're still learning on how to start countering it taking into consideration the foreseen risk factors and i'm sure craig lapsley will be able to uh, back me up on it's a fine line that you tread because you don't want to put anybody at risk but at the same time we have been here since 1861 through many many threats over those years just recently we had uh, i don't know whether you remember this time last year in the middle of the snow season there was a tree fell down in the spur family traveling through yeah. and unfortunately the mother died as a result of that it caused the spur to be closed for four months, for four days a week. So that stopped our clientele coming to us. It stopped any passing business tradespeople, workers. That in itself was just incredibly difficult to get through. That came right on the time of the initial COVID. Vic Rhodes said that that was a, an opportune time to have the spur closed because people couldn't come from Melbourne at all. 
So we've actually had a forced closure since the end of February of four days a week and of course then the first round of closures and now we're in um, stage three lockdown again with just takeaway food only and bottle shop. However, we are surrounded by the Yarra Rangers who are all stage four. So nobody can come out stage four into stage three anyway. So we're effectively closed down completely apart from the 500 local community who live in a 20 kilometre radius, and which is um, affectionately known as the Triangle. So you have Narbathong, Marysville and Buxton. Normally this time of year we get many of the travelling grey nomads that are travelling through to warmer weather. It is also the busiest time of the year because we uh, have a snow season and Lake Mountain is the closest alpine resort to a capital city in Australia. Fantastic family friendly introductory resort and there are many part time businesses up here, for example ski hires that work for three to four months of the year and that keeps them going for the rest of the year. This region, including ourselves, has lost that total business as well because the Alpine resorts have all closed down. So yeah, it's a fairly devastating time. As Sam said, JobKeeper is our lifesaver in in assisting to maintain our staff, although out of 21 staff that we had, only seven of them chose to take it up. And the reason is that being in a regional area, a lot of them were subsidising their social welfare benefits with working as a a permanent part-time of maybe 12 to 20 hours a week with us. They didn't want to lose their longer-term social benefits, so they chose not to go on to JobKeeper. Even though we have maintaining seven staff, we've taken the opportunity an ideal time take a really good look again inside our business as to what we can do to make us a venue of choice for people to go out of their way to come up to us after the restrictions are lifted again. We really are looking at all our processes, our policy, we're retraining some of our staff, we've spent a lot of time looking at all the maintenance items in the complex and the venue, things are always needing doing, but they're not quite a priority. We've made them all priority. And my husband and I are now at an age where we're looking at wanting to retire. And to be honest, it's been a lot of hard work in the last 11 years to get past the 09 fires and to, to get back, you know, standing again. We'd like to take a step back and we're looking at this as an ideal opportunity to present our business and our venue in the best possible light. And we look at, with the interstate restrictions and the border restrictions, when we are eventually allowed to open without restriction or just limited numbers, we can see that it will be an opportunity to present our venue in in the best possible light. In between the two lockdowns, we had almost three weeks where we were allowed, permitted to trade, without restriction but limited numbers. And it was very good. People were terrific, they were compliant, they really were excited about enjoying their own state and and doing things again. And we we look at hopefully in the next six to eight weeks that will happen again, you know, we'll be able to move forward. You're you're very um, measured in what you say for what you've been through, so well done. Um, It's it's interesting, isn't it, that we've now moved from, you know, this this traditional bushfire scenario that we're now seeing you know, 11 years on from 09, how uh, devastating it still is, although many people have, have been able to rebuild and move on. And uh, it's interesting that it was a it was an Australian event, but lived in, and owned by Victoria. And, and I think New South Wales, well, I know New South Wales are just working through that now to say they've had the 2009 event um, in 2019-20 and the issues mm-hmm. that they've got are exactly the same. Uh, the consequences are probably bigger um, because the footprint of fire was a lot larger. One thing mm-hmm. they didn't have, though, in their bushfires was the level of death that we had in Victoria. So there is a difference there. Um, 30, 33 uh, lives is very tragic, but it's not 173 either. And that's, uh, that's, a, mm-hmm. that's something that I've written to the Royal Commission to make sure that they understand the level of of death that happened in Victoria in an afternoon um, compared to the death that happened 
um, in New South Wales over weeks of fire is different yeah. and it tells you something has changed and I think it's the warning systems. And although Di said, yeah, there's a balance there about over-communicating and, and taking it from good decision-making to scaring people or fear, uh, there's a balance in that and there's a real balance to get that right. Um, but also the fact that, you know, we've got different phone systems now than what we had in 09, we, you know, you think what you've got in your pocket is a phone now. It's not a phone. It's a device that gives you so much information, whereas in 09, they were, they were, not everyone had a mobile phone, and if you did, they were very basic mobile phones. So, yeah, we've moved dramatically different. Um, now that I'm, I'm out and you look back in and you look at, uh, you're out of that job and you look back in at the, the, the pressure of what we've been through, um, as a state, we've done very well, but, you know, I think, Di, you, you've said it, it, it's got long, a long tail, these fires, a very long tail, life-changing mm -hmm. in many aspects, and it doesn't take much to, a much, or, or another thing to disrupt your progress of, of, of recovering. And you've just said that, Di, you know, there's been a number of events, even, even, and I won't say a simple, but an event that happens down the Black Spur that closes the Black Spur for four days each week for four months has a huge impact on on people's um, mo mo mobility but also the economics you know it's huge so so there's lots in it um and then you've got COVID, which is you know another whole discussion in its own right about the rights and wrongs and how that's being managed or not managed and i think um, but again you've got to be careful you don't get into the blame game in the middle of a of what is a significant event and you should be focused on you know how do we get out of it and how do we get and reduce the death rate uh, how do we re reduce the movement of of this virus that you know is is just invisible? And you think about New Zealand where they were celebrating 100 days of nothing, um, you know, no detection, and now they've got I don't know it's in the it's moving into the I think it was 13 this morning. It'll move a lot past that. So yeah, so you know, it, mm. yeah, yeah, it's 48 already. So you know, in a couple of days, it's come from four to 48. And you think, oh my God, you know, when does this thing go away, and what's the impact of it? And I suppose I, I've just this week taken some time to write in LinkedIn a couple of stories about community resilience, business resilience, and also personal resilience. And you now they all link to looking after ourselves in different ways, but they're all critical because, as we all know, if if you can't be meaningful in your employment, mm -hmm. um, that's really difficult and becomes quite destructive in in your mental health. And your and your you know your your your, your personal value, um, you know we've all got a story to tell. I've been lucky enough that I've been busy the whole time um, and been able to work from home and, and remain busy. But I oh yeah I know people that are just off work and it wasn't it's not planned at all. So it's a void. And Sam, you mentioned it before. It's also a chan chance to take some time out. But it's also extremely frustrating. Extremely frustrating about not being able to do the things you normally do and the way you do it. Um, earn, um, contribute, um, and you, you know you, you just think about local football and netball. Like you know, there's a whole season gone. Um, you know, the, you know, think about um, children in school, whether they're 17 or seven, seven or 17. You know, they basically lost a year of schooling, and uh, you know, and it, it will be a life experience um, that they haven't they haven't stopped learning. But it's not it's not what they thought they would be doing at the start of this year. So. So the impacts are huge, um, and I often talk about consequences. You know, impacts one thing, but the consequences will be a lot longer, and you know, the consequences are going to be quite significant. So, I don't think I need to say much else, Barry. But you know, even these forums are really important to have the ability to talk and listen, um, and question and learn, but also just share. And I think that's one of the things we've got to do is make sure we share and listen. Um, particularly, I, I think um, there's groups, and I mean we're all in it. But there's some people that are at the starts of their lives and this will put some people really back on their tail that aren't well established financially, may not be well established in a family sense. Uh, it will really challenge some of those people um, in both the short and long term. So yeah, there's a lot out of this and, and you know, we'll, we'll have to rely on government, governments to help us. And you can only hope that governments get their stuff together better than they've got together now. And it doesn't matter what colour of politics, I think there's a whole heap of stuff about where our government leaders take us um, and stop playing politics and get on about what, what public safety and what communities need would be a, 
a pretty good thing, I would have thought so. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, for those who don't know me, <clears throat> I've had a big background in the Black Saturday space, um, having lost multiple family members during the Black Saturday fires. I'd love to um, just provide some perspective from my own personal experience, but also from uh, being on the Bushfire Bereaved Advisory Group for four years and my participation in the Royal Commission. So these comments are about resilience and the inevitable tension that exists between um, resilience and, and being in a space of decline. And I think one of the learnings for me, and it came out so strongly in the bereaved advisory group, was um, this fundamental need as the starting, the foundational building block was acknowledgement of the the decline and you had to do that very well to help facilitate people's ability to access opportunities for resilience and to find their resilience. Um, so there's this really need for great care and respect around how we use the term resilience and build resilience into um, initiatives and it's critical and such a, a, an important thing to do. <clears throat> But I think that attention to acknowledgement of the decline seems to help people access their resilience um, as, as one tool to access that. We just look at um, everything on a week-to-week -week basis. We cannot plan any further than a week because, as you know, the goalposts keep changing um, with the um, rules and, and regulations. My focus has been on my staff. I have a, a duty of care to them, um, trying to build in <laughs> um, what Rhonda was just talking about, resilience, making them feel valued, keeping them motivated, um, and hoping them, offering them a, an investment into our future. We've, we're sitting down with them and inviting their ideas more than we ever have before on what they believe and um, a lot of them have got um, some inner strengths and values that we've never seen demonstrated before. So that, that's been great for us and that's kept us, um, if you like, positive and that's very clear that we must remain positive. Um, Nobody knows what's going to happen. Um, we all know that this is by nowhere ended. So to come up with grandiose ideas um, and a quick fix is not the way to go. So we plan for a week and, and then we sit down and we talk about um, the positive outcomes, the pros and cons, and what we could do better, plans. In the, in, you also got... Um, the ability at the moment, um, there's a little, there's quite a lot of mentoring that's being um, offered. There's a lot available through technology, as you now know, with um, webinars and, and however. We're taking um, opportunities with that to help everybody, um, you know, reskill or, or skill up a little further. And that's the way we're looking at it. <laughs> We can't change what is. We, it's not going to disappear. So what we're trying to do is be as positive and be ready for when we can start opening and welcoming people back. Yeah, I, um, it's interesting to hear Diane's story. And I've had the same kind of idea of uh, definitely upskilling um, with staff. I wasn't sure whether... Because I was talking about, uh, she was talking about local travel and, and tourism within Victoria being a big market. I'm, I'm kind of wondering what sort of support councils give her, um, if the councils have kind of got a roadmap to increase tourism within the state or if they get any help. I know the Moynton Peninsula kind of reach out and do a, do a um, newsletter, just, but they basically just update you with, the information the government have already given you. Um, I, my, my main concern now is this, this second lockdown, I think people are kind of just stepped into it. They've got their 
like especially with my staff, you can go, okay, we know what we're doing now. My biggest concern is if if this happens again, you let out again. If it ha- happens for a third time, I think that's really going to devastate a large portion of people. It's not, it hasn't gone away. Um, I think we've got to be really careful. New Zealand will be something we need to need to watch and understand what happens there. And you think they were celebrating? They were 100 days in, and they were celebrating. And it's done exactly what Sam just said. It's just brought them straight back. Um, I don't know. You won't eradicate this thing is my take on it. Um, so we do have to learn to live with it. Uh, but that means that I think we've got to change habits. I read this thing the other day that you can change habits in 21 to 30 days. So if you, don't, if you, if you want to create a new habit, like wearing a face mask, you do it for 20 days, you do it for 30 days, it becomes a habit. You, you then know to put it in your pocket or you know what to do. So I think we're going to create some new habits. But in creating some new habits... Uh, we've we've also got to understand that some of the things we used to do won't be there. So uh, I think the world's changed, um, and I think it's exactly what Di's saying. It's it's too dynamic at the moment to really pick it, but this is not going away. And, you know, if it got back into New Zealand and they, they work out how it got there, I think there's some real learnings and we've got to stop and learn. And the reason I say New Zealand is that their societal setup is very similar to ours. Um, you, you can learn from other sides of the world, but you watch Sweden. Sweden's so different than us. Um, and I think New Zealand's something we should watch and learn from, and it's close enough to learn from it. So I think, Barry, there's a real chance that you will go back into into stages, but we just have to be a little bit smarter in listening and doing it. Craig, on top of the COVID-19, which we're all dealing with at the moment, um, we've got around the corner um, a, another summer coming up, and the the combination of COVID-19 still being around and the likelihood of bushfires again because of um, hot weather, et cetera. How do you see it? Um, How do you see the the forthcoming um, summer period from from a bushfire perspective? Well, a couple of things. We'll always have a bushfire season. It's a matter of um, how long it's for. That's Victoria um, and southeastern Australia. So you'll have a bushfire season some way. Uh, I've just done a bit of work in the States um, and California or CAL FIRE has just done a whole lot of things different where they don't do staging, you know, where they stage all the trucks up and brief them. They're not doing that in big football labels anymore. They're doing it in small groups on the road. Uh, I just spoke to the acting chief of CFA. He's just been briefing their people to say they've got to come up with a different way to do it. So still have the trucks on the road, but they've got to do it different and how they participate together in small teams will be critical. Um, interesting, I just spoke to one of the big aviators running out of California and they're, they're about to bring their machines over here and they're saying all their pilots, they've kept them almost in a bubble. So when they come off duty, they, they've booked accommodation that they make sure that they're not intermingled with others. So they're booking more accommodation to cover it off. So they've got better spread in a motel or whatever they're doing. <clears throat> so things have changed, but I, I think the reality of fire is you still got to get out there. I think, those things that I mentioned are only part of it. Um, but I, I think they've got to start to use more aircraft quicker to try and pull fires up so you don't put large, big, large teams out there. Um, there's a way of doing that. So, And the Royal Commission's already had a look at that. So there are some things to change. But you know, I think that's what I talk about habits. The habit of CFA would be to put big trucks together on strike teams. That's the way they operate. So the norm of what they operate, they've got to change. And I think that's not easy in big organisation to change habits or well-established procedures. That's going to be a challenge. I think the tourist industry is one that deserves more attention than it's got. Uh, I've got a family member heavily involved in the tourist industry and they're pretty well devastated. I wonder as things go along, rather than prolonging job keeper and job safer, in Britain, they subsidised restaurant meals by 50%. Now, why shouldn't the government entertain the idea of subsidising businesses like Diane's by 50% to encourage people to go to these businesses and keep them running? Um, I think this is where um, the industry bodies, tourism industry bodies, come into play. Uh, we're members of VTIC. We're also members of the Australian Hotel Association and they have been um, wonderful in their representation to government during this COVID issue. Um, in 
assuring that there's the accommodation support program that has been put into place. Um, it, you've, we've also got um, uh, another expansion grant program that's just come into play. Uh, there's also an arts program um, for live music and emphasis on regional as well. Um, so quite often regional gets left out of the equation, but at the moment uh, regional is, is, seems to be having some great representation. Um, the figures that have been released from um, uh, Victorian Tourism Association and the Australian tourism industry are showing that um, there's something like 62% of revenue uh, Australia-wide is still currently being um, lost per week through hospitality and tourism. Mm. And they're just mind-blowing figures that are coming out. And I don't think it's ever been recognised as much as it's, what it, it's being recognised at the moment. We just hope, hope that it sticks and the dialogues keep continuing. What's been said very definitely resonates with East Gippsland. I'm sure all of you know that uh, as emergency manager for the district, um, East Gippsland has taken a lot of time uh, since, well, particularly since the 1st of January when the uh, East Gippsland Rotary Fire Aid Committee was commenced. Um, they've done an absolute power of work. As Craig said, this fire has been very different from 09 in that 09 came, it killed, it left probably within the space of predominantly about 10 or 12 hours. Uh, that was the Latrobe Valley fire. I wasn't involved at all with the, um, the other fires, but that was our Latrobe Valley experience. Whereas what happened with East Gippsland was more a bit of a slow burn, even though it was on a scale that no one was really prepared for. Uh, it did its predominant damage almost overnight, uh, but then it kept on burning and that made it very difficult to go into recovery uh, to any great extent. However, the committee got going immediately um, and they did an absolute power of work and they're still continuing to do that. I think probably uh, looking at this particular forum in terms of businesses, um, obviously the fact that it's a much more remote area, there aren't the bigger population areas once you get past Bairnsdale. But I think the issue that there is, is you've got everybody from bed and breakfast owners to wildflower nurserymen to veggie farmers to farmers that bear in mind have been in drought for three years already. So they've already been, you know, effectively on their knees in a lot of cases. Um, so there's those people that have been impacted by the fires immediately and in a lot of cases um, catastrophically. But then, of course, you've got the little um, hamlets like Buchan and Bruthen and um, Can River and all those areas. Can River wasn't actually impacted. The biggest problem for Can River was it was locked down for so long that it created a lot of issues of its own. So. Um, you, you've got so many, um, I guess, subsidiary sufferers business-wise because then on top of everything else with COVID, um, caravan parks, all those sort of people. I mean, I was talking to uh, the past president from Lakes Entrance at one of the committee meetings and he said that uh, I think it was the first week of February the Lake Entrance traders did their thing. Now, bear in mind, this was as school was normally going back. And he made the comment that Lakes traders had gone through a situation where the previous week they had suffered a week that they would normally have projected in the middle of July. And that was in the middle of the summer in their high season. So when you translate that right across the board, um, there's been a huge amount of subsidiary suffering from the fires, uh, which, of course, COVID's just absolutely trodden on and said, 
You know, we're going to make this really difficult. But I think Rhonda's comments about resilience um, are going to be vitally important. I mean, I've even noticed people who you still see the same thing. No, 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 don't worry about us. There are people worse off than we are. And you're looking at this property that's just decimated. Um, so, you know, you've got this typical Australian, nah, I'll be all right. Someone else is worse off than I am. Um, so it is a difficult one to deal with, but uh, the committee is doing on, on behalf of Rotary District 9820 an incredible job. Um, I think, as I said to you the other day, Barry, there are people in the area who may well be interested in becoming involved in this forum, and I have actually passed your details to the committee so that they can then talk to, um, you know, people who may be of, of um, value and benefit to get into this forum. Um, but yeah, thanks for the opportunity and, you know, it, it just keeps on keeping on. And Craig's comment about the fire situation, talking to one of the fire survivors from Caligny, who Rhonda would probably know, um, he told me during last year's fire season that the fire load out at uh, the Caligny La Trobe Valley area was 10 times higher now than it was um, in 09. So they're just waiting for it to happen out there again. And I thought, no, go away. I don't want to know. So, you know, it's the state of the nation. It's the state of what we live in. Uh, it's one of the things that makes Australia great, the way we regroup. We'll see how things go. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to contact Rotary Connections, it's rotaryconnections at outlook.com. See you next week.